Hello everyone. I am Dr. Rena Chavla. I am visiting professor at ESIC Medical College, Faridabad. And uh, so uh, as part of the SR teaching program, uh, we are going to take certain lectures and part of this is management of eclampsia. So um, uh, what do you need to know in the labor room when a patient comes with eclampsia or history of eclampsia? Uh, the basic management is what we are going to discuss. Now, um, if you see, these are all the initial uh, initial graphs are all the developing countries. So I won't go too much into theory. In fact, I'll hardly go into any theory at all. We will concentrate only on practical aspects, but just to give you a view of why this topic is so important is because if you see the developing countries, the red bar is the is the incidence of eclampsia. You can see it is so still so high in many countries, including ours. And the developed countries have still managed to keep the incidence of eclampsia quite low. And even if you see the blue bars, the blue bar is maternal death related to eclampsia. So if you see the maternal death related to eclampsia, that is also still quite high, especially in the developing countries. So our aim by uh, disseminating this knowledge on how to treat or the appropriate management of patients with eclampsia and severe preeclampsia is to help reduce these figures so that we come down to a much more uh, lower level, which uh, would help in reducing the maternal mortality and morbidity. Now, when a patient comes with eclampsia, the three main headings under which management follows, all right, is number one, seizure management, that is control of the seizures and prevention of further seizures from happening. Secondly, because the cause is preeclampsia or hypertension, we have to manage our hypertension also. And of course, the obstetric management, because we all know this, that is a rule that if a patient has preeclampsia or eclampsia, the final delivery of the mother. Pathology is the pregnancy itself. It, once we deliver her, everything else should settle back. So the three headings under which hypertension eclampsia is managed, I will repeat, are seizure management, hypertension management, and obstetric management. Now this is just a chart which. Um, I thought was a good a way to explain what needs to be done. So I would. So this is the timeline. So when a patient comes with eclampsia, approximately this timeline needs to be followed in the initial bit of the first few minutes. So the first five minutes would involve immediate patient that is stabilizing the airway, getting yes, avoiding steps to avoid this would be the initial five minutes along with preventing recurrent convulsions and we all know the drug of choice for that is magnesium sulfate. You still follow the so I will be describing this regime and other low dose IV regime. Next, once the seizures have been managed. Hypertension. Okay, because in that has recurrent convulsions, and if she is stable, assess how stable she is, and then we plan for the obstetric management that is preparing her for delivery, or if she's in a primary center referring her to a medical center with ICU and obstetric emergency obstetric care wherever available. So this is a flowchart which I thought was good and um, uh, I will refer it to, as I said, I will refer to it a time and again in this presentation. Now there are two scenarios which a patient can present with in the labor room. One is she can directly, uh, the patient is brought in the post state, she's, she's had a seizure at home, or wherever she's being referred from. And then she's, she comes to us and she's brought to us in either a post sickle state following a seizure at home or a health center. And this is a common scenario. Another common scenario, which actually should not happen if the patient is with you, eclampsia, please remember, is mostly a preventable condition. Very rarely you can't prevent it, but yes, most of the times it is preventable. So this should not happen if you have been managing her severe preeclampsia well. So, so the second scenario is the patient has a seizure right in front of you. 
in the labor room or in the ward in the hospital setting so these are the two scenarios with which the patient can come so in the first scenario the patient is brought following a seizure what do we do we initially assess the patient clinically we obtain history from a reliable which of course the patient won't be able to give a history we need to know her parity index we need to know her gestational age so whenever a patient comes to us the first thing you need to remember is before you go into this actually is to have a proper team there should be a person who is assigning or has assigned work to do for example the the main person the senior resident in the labor room can assign an intern or a junior resident or a nurse to go and take a quick obtain a quick history from a reliable witness when did the seizures start how many seizures has she had is she on any antihypertensive drug so check all her records when was the last ultrasound done when, what medication has she received before coming here has she already received a loading dose of magnesium sulfate so one person needs to be involved with taking history from a reliable witness the other team members should divide themselves into different parts okay and what do what does that involve one one important thing is assess the consciousness of the patient monitor her vital signs very importantly her pulse and her blood pressure auscultate the chest look for signs of pulmonary edema check her deep tendon reflexes are they brisk secure an intravenous line catheterize her if for monitoring urine output this is after her seizure episode after the patient comes in a post ictal state monitor her for recurrent seizures pulmonary edema abruption acute renal failure dic these are all complications which can happen with severe preeclampsia eclampsia so this is the initial assessment which has to be done within the first few minutes of the patient coming the second scenario is the patient has is having a seizure right in front of you so if she is having a seizure right in front of you what will you do so uh, that is acute care during a seizure okay so what do you do you give supportive care number one to prevent maternal injury if she is on a uh, ideally severe preeclampsia eclampsia patients are kept on a bed with side railings so put up the railings if they are not already put up or put pillows around her so she doesn't end up injuring herself okay make sure the railings have to be padded do not try to hold the patient down or stop their movement that will only worsen the situation so do not hold the patient down do not so just make the surroundings around her more comfortable so she doesn't injure herself use a mouth gag to avoid tongue bite so initial steps are these so supportive care to prevent maternal injury second is check the airway patency and ensure oxygenation all right so make sure her airway is patent how you do that by suctioning out secretions which the patient may aspirate so put the patient in a lateral decubitus position and suction the oral secretions then you can um, maintain oxygen by giving her uh, sorry uh, maintain uh, oxygenation by giving her oxygen 8 to 10 liters per minute and so although the initial seizure lasts only for a few minutes but even in those few minutes if if her um, saturation drops that can lead to significant consequences on both her and on the fetus so in main, make sure that oxygenation is maintained and we can use a pulse oximetry to check the saturation so that is the initial treatment so initial treatment as i said the patient can either will be brought to you in a post ictal state post a convulsion or she has a seizure right in front of you this is the initial thing what needs to be done now treatment coming next remember the charts and after the first 5 minutes are done you managed all this next comes magnesium sulfate so magnesium sulfate is the drug of choice to prevent subsequent convulsions in women with eclampsia also it is used in prophylaxis of eclampsia in women who have severe preeclampsia so magnesium sulfate you should know in detail you should not be sitting and calculating how to how many ampules to sit and give now once the patient comes so once the patient comes as i said one team member takes history one team member assesses her situation her uh, uh, does the steps i mentioned earlier one team member prepares the magnesium sulfate so all this should be done going on together okay so what do we follow we follow the pritchard's regime although for a few patients the zuspan regime also has been given so i will be describing both okay so the pritchard's regime basically says we give a iv and im loading dose followed by intramuscular maintenance dose okay so remember a few things once when we give iv magnesium sulfate the concentration should never exceed 20 percent okay but please remember remember magnesium sulfate is usually available as 50 percent concentration only very few institutes in india 
and the world over have specialized, have made a, a sample of 20% and have kept that in the labor room. And I've worked in such institutions, but most other institutions where I've worked in do not have 20% readily available. So it is available as 50% concentration. So each vial of that 50%, remember, has one gram of magnesium sulfate and that contains two ml. So two ml has one gram and that is why the concentration is 50%. If two ml had two gram, it would have been 100% concentration. So what does 50% concentration mean? It means that one gram in two ml is 50%. Okay, so this is how 50 this is how the magnesium sulfate is available what we have but remember when giving iv we never give such a high concentration we have to reduce or dilute the magnesium sulfate to make it 20 percent intramuscular you can give 50 percent iv you can give only 20 percent and it has to be diluted that is the main thing you need to remember so as i said what are the doses we give uh, so uh, pritchard regime the loading dose is four grams iv of 20 percent magnesium sulfate okay so four grams is the intravenous dose and 10 grams is the intramuscular dose. As I said, IV has to be 20% and IM has to be 50%. So we give a total of 14 grams in the loading dose. The maintenance dose is then given four hourly, five grams intramuscular and alternate buttocks. This is again 50% magnesium sulfate. Till when do we give it? Till delivery of the patient or the last seizure, whichever is later. So that is how we give magnesium sulfate. Now a bit more describing exactly how to make the dilutions and how to give administer magnesium sulfate and this should be on your fingertips you should not be start calculating and thinking or opening my ppt at that time you should be able to do this so you have to know this on your fingertips all right so how do you make 20 percent magnesium sulfate from 50 percent magnesium sulfate so let me make it simpler here you can see there are four ampules of magnesium sulfate. This is 50% magnesium sulfate. You have one ampule, two ampule, three ampule, and four ampule. Each ampule I said contains one gram. So one gram plus one gram plus one gram plus one gram is equal to four gram. And this is in how much ml? Each is two ml. So two ml plus two ml plus two ml plus two ml is equal to eight ml. So here we have four grams in eight ml of 50% magnesium sulfate, right? So what do we do now? We dilute it with distilled water. Okay. We dilute it with distilled water. How much distilled water? We dilute it. One second. We dilute it with 12 ml of distilled water. So now we have a 20 ml solution, right? 8 ml plus 12 ml. We have a 20 ml solution containing 4 grams of magnesium sulfate. And what percentage will this be? This will be 20%. Okay. So this is how we make our 20% magnesium sulfate from 50%. So this is 4 grams in 20 ml, which is 20% magnesium sulfate. I will repeat for those of you who are still not, not comfortable or not understood. So we have 4 grams in 8 ml, 50% magnesium sulfate, then 12 ml of distilled water. And then this becomes a total of 4 grams in 20 ml, which is of 20% magnesium sulfate. So basically we dilute the 8 ml with 12 ml of distilled water. So you should have four ampules in your hand to give the IV dose, dilute it with 12 ml of distilled water and inject that slowly at the rate of one gram per minute. So over at least four to five minutes, it has to be inserted very, very slowly, slow intravenous. Now, okay, so coming to the, again, let's, let's, let's recapitulate this. Okay, so this is four grams in 8 ml plus 12 ml and this becomes our intravenous loading dose of 20 ml 4 gram. All right, now this is how many ampules? See, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. So this is 10 grams of how much? 50% magnesium sulfate and how many ml will this be? Because there are 10 bottles sent into 2, 20 ml. So this is also 20 ml. This is our loading dose intramuscular. So see the IV loading dose is also 20 ml because we diluted it and the intramuscular dose is also 20 ml. And if of this we give, we divided it half 10 ml in one buttock and 10 ml in the other buttock. Just hold on, just give me a minute. I have to put my laptop on charge. Two minutes.
सॉरी अगर हम सेम लोडिंग डोज इज आल्सो 20 एमएल आईवी एंड इंट्रामस्कुलर इज आल्सो 20 एमएल द ओनली डिफरेंस इज वी हैव टू डाइल्यूट द 4 ग्राम्स व्हिच वी गिव आईवी विथ 12 एमएल सेलाइन एंड द द द इंट्रामस्कुलर डोज व्हिच इज 10 ग्राम्स इज गिवन एज सेम 20 एमएल okay without diluting because it is 50% and we need 50% so this is how we give the loading dose the next is the maintenance dose okay okay so the maintenance dose is as i said it is 5 grams intramuscular 50% magnesium sulfate fourth hourly okay so here we have 1 2 3 4 5 ampules this will be 10 ml so 10 ml in alternate buttocks every fourth hourly but before giving and i think we all know this now we've been learning this since undergraduate days we have to check the patient's respiratory rate why because in the in the event of magnesium toxicity there could be respiratory depression okay so we do not measure in most centers and uh, uh, it's also been proven that clinical monitoring of magnesium levels is same as therapeutic monitoring of magnesium levels in the blood so clinical monitoring is very important respiratory rate has to be checked it should be more than 12 per minute okay dtrs should be present because again neurological depression can happen with magnesium toxicity so these should be present and the urine output should be more than 30 ml per hour okay why is urine output important so magnesium toxicity does not cause renal failure magnesium is mainly excreted by the kidney and renal failure can be a complication of severe preeclampsia eclampsia so if the woman is going to renal failure she will be failing to excrete the magnesium and that can lead to a build up of magnesium in the serum so that can lead to magnesium toxicity so we need to ensure her urine output is adequate before giving the further doses so respiratory rate dtr and urine output need to be checked and as i said continue till 24 hours of the last seizure or her delivery whichever is later that's very important okay now the zuspan regime so if you have an iv infusion pump okay the zuspan regime can also be used and this is a low dose it is at a, the total dose is lower than the prichard's regime so your chance of magnesium toxicity is lesser so if we have an iv infusion pump this is to be preferred what is this dose this again is the loading dose is the same it doesn't have the im dose it just has the 4 gram 20% magnesium sulfate how we prepared it for the prichards the same way we prefer we prepared it for the zuspan over 5 to 10 minutes we give this loading dose and then a maintenance dose is given now this is the one which is given as an iv infusion so we give this as 1 gram per hour of 20% i remember iv is always 20% no 50% in iv so 1 gram per hour magnesium sulfate is an iv infusion and i will tell you how it is prepared so here we have our loading dose okay so same 1 2 3 4 with 12 ml of distilled water is equal to our loading dose 20 ml 4 gram 20% okay so four ampules mix it with distilled water 12 ml you have 20 ml give it over 5 to 10 minutes slow iv now here is the important thing which you should know if you have an iv infusion pump available what do we do we give 1 gram hourly intra venous 1 gram per hour is given so how do we prepare that we take 4 grams of magnesium sulfate in 200 ml of normal saline so 4 grams of magnesium sulfate in 200 ml of normal saline and we set the infusion pump at the rate of 1 gram per hour that is about 50 ml per hour okay so 4 grams in 200 ml so 1 gram will be in 50 ml right so that is the rate at which we set the infusion pump until 24 hours after delivery or since the last fit as i said before so this is zuspan's regime so here you take for this is load this is the maintenance dose so we take four ampules of magnesium sulfate take a 200 ml ns bottle take the infusion pump set it at the rate of 50 ml per hour now alternately suppose you don't have an iv infusion set ideally you should you should not you should not uh, uh, use it without one but it has also been described if you don't have an infusion set and if you have very good monitoring available what you can do is you can use 12 ampules so 12 grams magnesium sulfate in 1 liter of ringer's lactate so take 12 grams of magnesium sulfate that is 12 ampules of 50% mix it with 1 liter of ringer lactate and give it at the rate of 80 ml per hour iv that will be the same amount that will that will go as 1 gram per hour so what should, ideally what should you do 4 grams in 20 ml to 200 ml of ns 
set it at, set it at the rate of 50 ml per hour. If you don't have an infusion pump and you want to give suspend, put 12 grams in one liter of RL and give it at the rate of 80 ml per hour intravenous using an inflow line regulator. So this is Zospan's regime, the loading and the maintenance dose. Loading dose is only the IV, not the IV. Maintenance is preferred if you, so Zospan is preferred if you have a IV infusion pump and most places these days now do have an IV infusion pump. This is in a way better because it is a low dose regime like the Sibai Zospan, both are low dose regime and uh, the chance of magnesium toxicity remains less. Okay, so a few other important points when giving magnesium sulfate, what should you remember is add 1 ml of 2% lidocaine before giving the intramuscular injection. It is very, very painful. So um, anesthetize, locally anesthetize the area before giving the um, uh, magnesium sulfate. Now also remember about 10% of all patients will have a recurrent seizure. So you've given, you've done your acute management, you've given magnesium sulfate, but then she has another seizure. What should you do then? What should you do? You should give magnesium sulfate again, but how much? Half the low, half the IV loading dose. That is two grams IV, 20% needs to be given. So instead of four ampules, two ampules. So two grams IV have to be given. Again, dilute to make it 20%. Okay, now rarely despite adequate doses and therapeutic doses of magnesium sulfate, seizures can still persist. What do you do then? You give lorazepam, 4 gram intravenous over 3 to 5 minutes. Also importantly, involve a critical care specialist in this scenario. So if your magnesium sulfate is not working, give lorazepam, 4 gram IV, but also involve a critical care specialist who will help you manage the patient better. Okay, also look for signs of magnesium toxicity. How I've already told you the clinical monitoring, we do three things, respiratory rate, urine output, and DTRs. Okay, but um, so routine monitoring with serum magnesium levels is not recommended. As I said, clinical monitoring is found to be equally effective. But if you do do, do serum monitoring, then I'll just let you know what the values are. So remember, DTRs are lost at a serum magnesium level of 9 milligram per deciliter. Respiratory depression occurs at 12 milligram per deciliter and cardiac arrest occurs at 30 milligram per deciliter. So if you are getting serum magnesium levels checked, you should know the cutoff values. So patients at risk with impending respiratory depression may require intubation and emergency correction. So we all know the antidote for magnesium sulfate is calcium gluconate. How much do we give? 10%, 10 ml IV slowly over five minutes, um, five to seven minutes, it should be given. Okay, so but so that's why clinical monitoring is very important, provided that the DTRs, so DTRs are the first to go. So if DTRs are still there, then the likelihood that she's going into serious toxicity like respiration is very less. So that's why your clinical monitoring is very, very important. DTRs, you have to check every fourth hourly because if DTRs are present, the chance that she has severe toxicity is much, much less. And if you are checking magnesium levels, you can, or if you find, do find symptoms of uh, clinical symptoms of toxicity, then you can check the magnesium levels every four to six hours. Okay. Um, so uh, when do you check this? As I said, if clinical parameters, if the urine output is less or creat is high, or if signs of magnesium toxicity. Now coming back to the chart. So we have done with, what are we done with? Now we are done with this part. We are done with this part. Now coming to control of severe hypertension. Okay, so control of severe hypertension is our next goal. We have to manage her blood pressure to prevent more complications like abruption, DIC, ARF from happening. So what do we do? Our initial drug of choice is Lebetalol. Okay, so Lebetalol is given, and I think all of you know this regime and just revising because again, it's something which you should know and not open your books and um, in, uh, uh, check your uh, phones to see what the dose is. So 20 milligram over two minutes is given IV labetrol. Check after 10 minutes with a BP is still not below 160 by 110, repeat 40, so double it. So 20 initially, then 40 over two minutes, still not low than 80. 80 can be repeated twice. So total of 220 milligram can be given labetrol. <clears throat> okay, uh, some... Uh, guidelines like the ACOG says after 20, 40, and 80, and if there's still no reduction in the blood pressure, sh sh shift to IV hydralazine. Now, um, IV hydralazine is not uh, commonly available in most places. Okay, so how much do you, if you, but if you do have it, this is the next best step, labetrol, then hydralazine. How much do you give? You give 5 milligram IV over 1 to 2 minutes. 
then check at 20 minutes and then uh, administer 5 to 10 milligram again if again after 40 minutes it persists administer 5 to 10 milligram again maximum cumulative dose of 20 to 30 milligram is given if there is tachycardia however stop the hydralazine so i will repeat 5 milligram you give then check at 20 minutes repeat 5 milligram check at 40 minutes check give again 5 milligram maximum you can go is 20 to 30 milligram but if despite this hypertension still persists then you need to involve a critical critical care specialist a physician or a critical care specialist and then what do you do what usually what they do start is a nicardipin infusion or more commonly in the setups we work in ntg infusion is started as i said in consult with a critical care team so this is control of severe hypertension alongside this uh, along with the control of hypertension, we have to send the investigations, okay, because we have to see how severe the, um, uh, uh, how the lab work is and also how we need to manage the patient, we need to prepare her for delivery, we need to have a urine albumin which can be done stat, although the uh, recent ACRJ definition now says proteinuria is not essential for diagnosing preeclampsia, but yes, a urine albumin should be done. CBC with peripheral smear, we need to see the level, her hemoglobin, if there's any hemolysis happening, if there is associated health syndrome, also thrombocytopenia, her renal function tests, her liver function tests, her coagulation profile, very, very important because all this will help us in planning her delivery. So this is also done. So we did, we, uh, did her acute management, we did, gave her magnesium sulfate, we controlled her hypertension, we did her lab work, also uh, fetal monitoring, see if the fetus, if there's any evidence of fetus, fetal distress or not. And then that will also help us decide the mode of delivery. So coming to obstetric management, delivery has to be expedited. So remember, it has to be expedited. Does, that does not mean you go and do a cesarean section for every eclampsia patient. So eclampsia patients preferably should be delivered vaginally. Cesarean will increase the more morbidity and mortality so preferably vaginal delivery but again that dep depends on the gestational age she's come the bishop's score that she has her how critical she is all right so it depends on various things okay any uh, obstetric factors related maybe she's previous cesarean or maybe she's placenta previous so then you don't have much of a choice really so cesarean section as i said only for obstetric indication if thrombocytopenia is associated, rec we recommend platelet transfusion if the uh, platelet count is less than 50,000. Okay. Uh, regional anesthesia is avoided if there is thrombocytopenia or coagulopathy. And general anesthesia in eclampsia it does increase the risk of aspiration and failed intubation due to airway edema. So, of course, this part, this anesthetist will take care of, but we need to keep this in mind. Okay. Very importantly, again, is even in preeclampsia is avoid fluid overload otherwise she will go into pulmonary edema now post delivery what do we do we continue magnesium sulfate till 24 hours after the last seizure or delivery whichever is later we continue monitoring of the vital signs urine output reflex for reflexes for at least 72 hours post delivery so ideally the patient should be in the hdu unit or the icu if she's on ventilatory support and continuous monitoring should be done for at least, uh, so, sorry, continued monitoring should be done for at least 72 hours post delivery. Uh, and once uh, she's in the postnatal period, you need to check her, assess her blood pressure. And these are the drugs that can be safely given if she is lactating. So, what are the drugs which can be given in lactation? Lebetrol can be given if she was on lebetrol, can simply be continued. Atenolol, nifedipine, amlodipine, and enalapril are also safe in the postpartum period, especially if she is lactating. So if she's on antihypertensives, follow her up. Uh, if you discharge her on, on antihypertensives, she needs to be followed up after two weeks. And if her blood pressure, her, uh, her high blood pressure persists at her six-week visit also, then she needs to be referred to a physician to see if there is any underlying cause for her essential hypertension. So detailed evaluation if she's still on antihypertensives at six weeks. Okay, so among in all this, one critical thing which I missed, and that's why I actually put at the end, because although I put at the end, it has to be, it has to go on side to side. So communication is very, very important these days. Uh, uh, it, is, it is a part and parcel of a doctor's life. It is very important to keep talking, we may not be able to talk to the patient because she may not be in such a condition, but her attendance, 
her uh, relatives have to be kept informed about what is happening how critical she is how the mother is how the baby is time and again compared to other patients the status of the mother needs to be key. we need to keep updating the relatives and this part many times gets missed out because of the criticality of the situation but it is very very important as residents as primary caregivers in the labor room counseling is a huge part of the job that you do so um, uh, thank you everyone so as i said medicine is a science as uh, william osler said medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability but with so much evidence now available eclampsia should not should actually be not happening uh, most of the time because it is very much preventable not always but yeah most of the times yes and if it does happen we should know what steps to be taken to prevent further maternal and fetal mortality so thank you very much